for those who are listening right now and they're thinking to themselves, I would love to have something like this someday, but I don't even know where to start. Don't follow the white rabbit down the hole. Don't, don't, you know, get distracted by all those squirrels because I am, again, the queen of all of that stuff. Success no. is never owned, it is rented, and rent is due every day. Mm, that is a good one. I just really love that quote. So. I know. Welcome back to the Successful Stylist Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ambrosia Carey, and I'm excited to introduce a guest, but really quickly, I wanna thank all you guys for those five-star reviews. It really helps the right people find us. Today, we're actually gonna be hanging out with a fellow entrepreneur that has had a successful business. She actually is running a bridal business, has been doing it for a while. She has a book that she just published, and I have it in my hands right now, Hairpins and Happiness author, Carlina De La Cruz. Welcome to the SSA podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yes. So it's kind of funny because I feel like I don't even remember. We started just talking lightly with one another, um, comparing notes. And I feel like we just really hit it off in the DMs. And that's kind of an yeah. extension of how like a successful business goes. And this was like a prime example of like melding minds, like two minds that think very similarly in this industry. And it seems like you mm -hmm. are really doing a lot for our community, just really wanting to help other stylists be successful in their business. So I really want to hear about your journey and your story. If you don't mind me just jumping right into it, like how did you get started with your bridal Absolutely. business? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. So I feel like I, well, I've done it forever. So, um, I became licensed as a, as a hairstylist when I was 20 and um, it almost happened. It was very organic. I, I worked for a uh, commission salon for the first, oh God, uh, 13 years of my career. So with doing that, you have very little control over your own business or so it seemed at the time back, you know, a hundred years ago. So um, <laughs> as, as bridal parties came in, I usually ended up having them in my books because when I was fast and obviously as a commission stylist, they want you to get as many people in and out as possible because it's more money for the salon. Um, and I did a good job and I loved doing them. So everybody had no problem just kind of shoving those off on me. And um, I was more than happy to take them. So that was kind of the start of it. And as um, my career progressed, it ended up being hey, these doors are closing, unfortunately, because that's what happens in our industry sometimes. Things pivot uh, and it's out of our control. And we have to make the best of those things and make opportunities. Uh, door closes, window opens, that kind of stuff. So uh, when I was given the opportunity <laughs> to be chair rent, um, I was all of a sudden in charge of my own books and in charge of my own pricing and everything. And that's when my bridal business exploded because I had complete control and I was listening to people like you, Ambrosia, um, that are always kind of mentoring and helping and, um, you know, the, the business side of things, not just the actual hands-on stylist stuff. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the long and the short of how <laughs> I got started. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now you're taking over your own bridal business and you're starting that behind yeah. the chair still, at what point did you start to kind of expand that bridal business and, um, and, and are you still behind oh, the chair? I am still behind the chair, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I am, uh, behind the chair doing cuts and color for my, my beloved, lovely, uh, regular clients that I've done for, you know, some of them, the 20 years, um, plus, <laughs> and, um, then on the weekends, I get to do all what I call the fun stuff, which is when I get to really spread my wings and do all of the the bridal stuff and the hair shows and, the, you know, when I get to teach other uh, stylists at, uh, there's a couple of local um, cosmetology schools that have me come in and do up to classes and stuff. And um, yeah, those are the things that kind of recharge my creative battery all the time. I love that you are feeding that creative brain and the business yeah. mind. So you're right and left side. I love that you're feeding both of those so that you can give energy to one and 
uh, you yes. also are feeding back mm-hmm. into the other. And I think that's such a, that's my takeaway based on like what you've been doing. So I, what prompted you to write this lovely book here? And actually I even wanted to tell you <laughs> one of my favorite quotes that you have in here, which was an anonymous, um, I love quotes by the way. I, I mean, I don't know if that just <laughs> makes me like human cause we all love quotes, but I really love this one. I know. Success is never owned. It is rented and rent is due every day. Mm, that is a good one. I just really love that quote. So I know. What made you decide like, oh, I'm just going to write a book and like you made it happen and you <laughs> published a hardcover and it's actually super adorable and it, it's, it has your personality in it. It's so fun. Um, so tell us thank about you. that. So I thank you so much for mentioning that my personality is in there. My editor and friend, uh, Sarah Hendrickson, helped me make sure that my voice was throughout the book and it didn't feel like a textbook. It didn't feel like, oh, God, I have to go read this book. Um, you know, I just have to, you know, trudge through it. I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted it to be fun. So um, anyway, thank you for mentioning that. But uh, the reason for writing it in the first place was I had a lot of clients for years, really, that would say things like, gosh, you must have so many stories, especially the quote unquote um, uh, bridal bridezillas and uh, all of the bridal nightmare stories that you think of on like, reality TV, which are yeah. very far and few between in reality, but I have a couple, but, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but they're far and few Just between. Just to keep it interesting. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you gotta, you gotta just sprinkle them in every Get once in a while. a little spice but, in there. Uh, for the most part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little spicy, a little, you know, a little sass every now and again, but it's so far and few between and it's very rarely a bride actually, but I digress. Um, but I, I had so many clients and coworkers and stuff go, oh my gosh, you should write a book. You have all these stories. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I should write a book. So that was well over a decade ago, embarrassingly. <laughs> I am also a mother of two. I'm also full-time. I also have excuse after excuse after excuse because we're human. And uh, things just kind of carried away. But I would be plugging away and, and really getting a bearing on like kind of what I wanted to write. And I would st- take a step back and go, wait a minute, who in the hell is this for? Like, who am I writing this for? Who mm. cares about the sassy BS behind the scenes for a whole book? I, eh, I don't know. So I would kind of scrap, you know, 17 chapters and then come back and rewrite. And um, it took quite a while for me to really um, find my voice and find exactly who this was for. Um, and I, I ultimately came to, I really want to help other people in our industry, uh, maybe skip some of these steps. And a lot of them are time wise. Uh, obviously you're not going to be using MapQuest to get to a bridal booking anymore. So some of the things that are my experiences don't matter so much anymore, but, um, you know, they're humorous, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I wanted to help people kind of skip some of the the nonsense. Yeah, good old MapQuest, man. I wonder if that's even around anymore. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, that's actually a solid question. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, it I was no good need. for a while. I definitely used it when it was like it was very much needed back when it came out. It felt very like wow, oh, this yeah. is like the future. Uh, so yeah. I'm I am curious. Like, it, it's so cool to hear that you had this moment or this epiph- epiphany where you decided, like, wait a minute, who am I writing this for? Because that's so much what we talk about. Like, that's the the kind of building blocks of, of even starting a business is like, who am I actually speaking sure. to? Who am I trying to put in my chair? Who am I trying to market to? And so like the brand of that, uh, your imagery yeah. helps you figure out who you're marketing to. I love that. That's a wonderful story. So, yeah. okay. So if we were talking about this whole process, you and <laughs> it, even though, yes, it took a decade, but it's always the journey, not the destination. And sometimes it like took that time to figure out the clarity, um, to put something out that you're proud of and that you feel good about. I'm so curious, like what aha moments came to you after you created it? Like you had some moments as you were building this, but after you put it together, were there any things that came to you where you're like, I might've done this a little differently, or this is something that I probably would have done during that 10 year period. Like, 
Um, it, for those who are listening right now and they're thinking to themselves, I would love to have something like this someday, but I don't even know where to start. And 10 years seems so daunting to me. And so if they're thinking to themselves, gosh, I really want to do this, but I, I have a goal that I really want to make this start happening in the next year or two, what would be your advice? First of all, I think daily, we all have aha moments, whether we admit it or not. So there's that. Um, and they can be tiny little ahas and other things that are like, where have I been all my life? But um, <laughs> I would say if you wanted to do something like write a book or whatever, pick pick a, a, an end date. Like that was the thing. I finally, I had been starting to listen to a lot of author for author uh, podcasts and, and uh, you know, watching them on social media and stuff like that. And every author said, get words on the page, just do it, pick a date, that's your publishing date, make it happen. And my publishing date was um, September one of 2023. And I missed it by a month. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was out of my hands and things happened. But my I, I had the words on the page, everything was edited, and we were ready to rock and roll. I had, you know, gotten my uh, cover taken care of and everything. And I just made, you have to decide to make it happen. You have to do it for yourself because nobody else is going to come in and do it for you. And I was writing and writing and deleting and writing and deleting. And I just felt like I was going in circles. And I, when I finally put my mind to it, it was like, no, this is ridiculous. I'm finishing this project. I did. And I'm like the queen of procrastination, unfortunately. <laughs> So when I finally got my head out of my keister and I was like, look, this is happening. <laughs> I made it happen. So just stick to it. Don't, yeah. uh, don't follow the white rabbit down the hole. Don't, don't, you know, get distracted by all those squirrels. <laughs> Cause I am again, the queen of all of that stuff. So I think that would be the major thing that I would go back 10 years and tell my former self, just stick to it, get the words on the page, make it happen. Awesome. So a, a lot of it has to do with mindset, it seems like um, picking Absolutely. that date, and then making up your mind and then actually putting Correct. words on the page and and following through with it and really just telling yourself that this is going to happen. So um, I think sometimes it's so easy to let our minds dictate what is or isn't going to happen. And it's hard to catch those things if you're not aware of those thoughts or you don't stop those thoughts and then like replace it with something else. So um, I love that you just Absolutely. simply put it as it, it, you put it so simply by just saying like, you have to make up your mind to do it and you actually have to just make it happen because no one's going to do it for you. And even though it, it could be such an obvious phrase, I think sometimes those of us who have something that we're tied to so passionately and emotionally, it's so easy for us to make excuses or to put it off or procrastinate, like you were saying, procrastination, which is like a, a nice way of saying perfection. And so I, I, I yes. think that's something that's going to be the most relatable. I know I can relate to it. So I'm sure all of you guys listening are like, yeah, I know that's me too. Um, so, okay. Going back to your vital business, I would love to hear mm -hmm. what are some like specific marketing strategies that have worked for you and attracting like your ideal clients, kind of going back to those ideal clients and speaking to them. <sighs> so from a very, very early point in my career, I definitely started um, collaborating with other um, what we call friend doors now, but that wasn't a thing at the time. Right. It's kind mm -hmm. of a newer thing that the kids are saying, but, <laughs> um, you know, other wedding vendors that were interested in just making creative magic. And so you get a, a florist or two in, in your, um, in your group, and then you have a couple of photographers and so on. Um, definitely a local bridal shop and everybody just kind of pulls together and makes this beautiful imagery come together um, so that you all walk away with the pages. There's no money exchanged, yada, yada. So um, putting up together these styled shoots really made a big difference. And then within those frienders, you are able to um, truly suggest each other's work and you kind of know each other's vibe. And if you work with a photographer and you're like, she's really talented, but she's not really um, my vibe in particular, then you don't do another styled shoot with her and you find another photographer and you, you just keep, you know, kind of honing in your own um, 
ideal clientele through those those uh, vendors and other creatives. And it's, I can't believe the network that I am so lucky to have this this beautiful network of of women, a couple guys, uh, mm-hmm. that come together to make these beautiful, beautiful styled shoots. And um, they all we all scratch each other's backs and lean on each other. And it's like, hey, I'm booked for this, but I know you're very talented and I've worked with you on these other shoots. Are you available? We we all have this network of people and now we all come together and make these beautiful dream weddings for these women and through no money exchange, like everybody is just happy to help each other. It's, it's pretty astonishing, actually. It's, it's magic just watching the collaborations come together and the sparks just kind of fly. It's, it's crazy. I love the word collaboration. And I feel like it's one of those words that get heavily used throughout like social media, I guess, if I were just referring to that. And what I'm hearing from you is that during that collaboration process, sometimes there isn't money being exchanged. And I I feel like yep. there's this narrative right now. Um, correct me if you think if you feel differently, but it seems as though most people are talking about only doing things if there's like money involved or only doing things, you know, there's not a lot of people talking about the freedom of doing things pro bono or for the excitement and the the joy of doing that. So I yeah. would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that because I feel like we should be kind of highlighting that story a little bit more that there is so much more that you can monetize than only money. And it can lead to monetary value later on down the road, but um, feeding that creative- It almost thing. always does. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So, yes. so yeah, no, talk about that a little bit more. Cause I think that's something that it's sometimes people can't wrap their brain around it. If there's not like a direct monetary exchange, or we don't see like a direct right. return on that investment, that ROI that everyone's focused on. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah. that? Absolutely. So I, I have had many stylists in my, in my career turn me down as like, assisting me or anything because they're like, Oh, I only get how much and you're no, I I'm, I'm worth more than that. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure you are. But that's all that's in the budget or no, nobody's getting paid. But you'll end up with all these beautiful images for your website for further, you know, social media, whatever's and um, just making those connections and those real relationships with photographers and so on they are going to tell you about brides. They are going to tell you about makeup artists and, and they're going to tell people within your industry and within your, your area. And you build this amazing network of people that all scratch each other's backs. And that is, that is without value. That has so much more value than, you know, the money that you would have taken away from that shoot. And in the meantime, if you're not getting paid, usually sky's the limit. You are the creative genius behind yes. it. You get to do whatever the hell you want. So yeah. if there's a money exchange, they're usually saying, we need a low bun. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to do a low bun. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to do this frothy, beautiful, you know, Carrie Bradshaw situation. And, <laughs> um, you know, you can't do that if you're getting paid a lot of times. So a lot of times the true magic happens when it's just you guys getting together and being creative and making it happen. So, um some of my favorite shoots are the ones that I didn't get paid on. Same. Some of the most boring shoots that I do pay the best. Yeah. And exactly. having that balance, it's it's true. <laughs> yeah. So having that balance, it's like, well, I got paid beautifully for this show, shoot. I almost said shit, but I meant shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> shit, shoot, potato, potato. Schmeh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you get paid really well. It's very lucrative. But you have to balance that out with something that recharges your creative battery and makes your heart pound and makes you excited for the next shoot. That's such a opinion. good one. I mean, if we're going to be talking about yeah. nuggets, that's like the golden nugget of all. I think that's the biggest <laughs> nugget. That's the biggest nugget good. you could take. And <laughs> if anything, I mean, I know this is not new news, you guys, but I just think hearing this from other people who have found their level of success and you even talk about success in your book a little bit where it's like it is a a constant evolving journey. So if we were to impart like any last words of wisdom or just even pieces of advice to our listeners who get stuck in their head, who are afraid to take that next step or even the first step, I would say, 
um, what would that advice be? I know that's like a loaded question, but, um, you know, just along the same process of what you were talking about. Yeah. I think a lot of it is just get out of your own way and make it happen again. Like choose that you want to do something and do it. Like, again, I have so many talented individuals that I work with that don't post their work on social media because they don't want to seem braggy or, right. or whatever. And I'm like, what you, first of all, you should be bragging. This is gorgeous. And second yeah. of all, how's anybody going to know how talented you are if you don't go out and tell them. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying like, there is a difference between bragging and just being confident in your work, but we, and we have to, you know, tread the line, that tightrope. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cause you don't want to be like, I'm the best. And let me tell you why that's <laughs> gross and it feels icky and nobody, yeah. nobody likes doing that. But, um, you know, it, nobody's going to know about you if you don't tell them about your work or show them about your work or, or whatever. So, you know, it's just reiterating that piece where it's like, it just starts out with one little step at a time, but you have to make this step happen. So thank you for that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so now comes the fun the stuff. <laughs> Tell everyone where they can find you um, and how they can get access to your book and all of those great things. And I will definitely make sure that I link that in the show, the show notes. So um, my book is available in both ebook format and paperback, and it's on amazon.com uh, hair pins and happiness. And that is my everything else that I kept it very simple. Uh, my website is www.hairpinsandhappiness.com. Um, my Instagram is at hairpinsandhappiness.com. And, uh, so is my Facebook. So that makes it so much easier and streamlined. (laughs) So hairpins and happiness. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and imparting all of your wisdom. Um, I would love to just hear about the next phase of your journey. And obviously, like, we'll be chatting along, along the way and, Absolutely. Uh, and Instagram and stuff like that. But um, I really it was a joy to meet you um, in a social platform and like to see you in real life. And I just really am grateful for you to spend your time with all of us and, and tell us about your your happiness because it's it's infectious. Yeah. So thank you for hanging out with well, us. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. All right. Well, guys, we will have everything else in the show notes. So make sure you visit that, Um, you know, obviously hang out for more and we will see you all next week. Don't forget to dream big, set goals, take action. See you later, guys. 